Um, I am not going to talk about anything really that we're doing right now. Uh, if you were here last year, you might have seen Anon Thacker, from, who was with Development City at the time, talk about some of the work we were doing with Skynet, where we were pulling in OSM data uh, and, and DG data and Mapbox data and, and using that to predict roads. Really cool project. We've done a few other things on it. It's all online. It's called Skynet. Go check it out if you're interested. Um, the only like, thing that I want to draw out of that to, to give this whole conversation a little bit of context is that the hardest part of machine learning right now, we've, we've kind of got the imagery figured out. We've, we've really got the compute, pretty much got the compute figured out. The hardest part is getting the training data, getting those labels. Uh, and for most of the world, that, that data doesn't exist. You don't have uh, uh, government entities that have 20 years of, of really clean records. And so for most training, uh, most machine learning that's going on in the developing world, you all are providing the training data. It is coming from OSM, and that's something that we rely on heavily, and I think others do as well. And so for you all, like, whether or not you're doing the machine learning, you should know that you are all involved in this project uh, in some way. So I think that's the only thing that I wanted to highlight from there. All right, humans and robots. So I kind of want to, rather than, what I want to do here is, is sort of look towards the future. I think that there has been a really healthy and vibrant debate within the community about what is an appropriate role for these sorts of techniques within the OSM community, and how do we make sure that we preserve the important things about our community and the, the human beings that build our community while also integrating in some of these tools. And so that's really what I want to approach today. I, um, by, by way of prologue, uh, humans. Hey, they're, they're a pretty important part of this equation, and they've done some really impressive stuff. Uh, Drishti did a much better job of talking about this than, than I did, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I, I think that we all recognize that OSM is, at a, is a very exciting point in its development, and is at a bit of a turning point. We've mapped a lot, and as a result of, of, of our efforts, OSM data is now part of the infrastructure for a lot of efforts. It is part of the infrastructure for groups like Facebook and, and Digital Globe and, and Apple and others. It is part of what they rely on. It's part of the infrastructure for groups like the, the Red Cross and World Bank and other people who are doing development work for governments. People are using that and relying on that. And that is, and that sort of is, is, is a lot of responsibility for, for, for folks like us, but, but it's, it's really important. And the other thing that's happened recently is efforts like Missing Maps have expanded the reach of OSM into areas, into a lot of places that it hadn't been before. But you'll notice from this map, and you would have noticed it even better from Drishi's map, there's still a lot of places that are missing. Uh, and the only thing that I, that I want to add, she, hers is, is better, the only thing I want to add is that some of these are in places like like China and Pakistan and some of the former Soviet Union, and countries where, uh, India, countries where there is, uh, that range from a, a situation where citizen mapping is in a legal gray zone to countries where citizen mapping is, is actually prohibited by law and people who map on the ground are doing so under, under great risk. And so that's another aspect of this that I think is worth keeping in mind when we think about how, how is the best way to collect data for those areas. Um, the other, I guess the other thing that I would say that is that this is still a hard, a hard job and there's a lot of work left to do. It, I, it is foolish to bet against us, to bet against OSM, but it is also just as foolish to assume that it is uh, uh, a given thing. And, and I think that as we get to parts of the world that are going to be harder to reach, that's where we need to get more creative about how we, how we, how we map that, how we map those parts of the world. So then the question is, do we care? Do, should we map at all? Are there reasons why we should endeavor to get every single thing on the map? Or is it enough to map in areas where we have the community, where we have the reach? Um, and I think that there are a number of reasons why we should. Um, one is the network effect. Our data is more valuable if other people's data is there as well. Ian's, house, uh, Ian's openhousemap.org is not a very useful site for a lot of things. Um, if you don't have, uh, people don't just care about the place they're in, they're, they care about places that they want to go to, places that they're connected to, uh, how they compare to other places. And so the reason, part of the reason is in our own selfish interests, our data has more value if we have all of, if we have other data in there as well. The other is that we actually need this. The places that are most vulnerable in the world are also the places that, um, that are most require this sort of information to uh, to plan better, to recover from disasters, and I don't want not just recover from disasters, but also to 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 
to uh, better prepare, to, to have better, more resilient um, uh, uh, cities, to have companies that can build the, the next uh, transport app on top of open data. These are all things that are, that are critically important and why we need this data. And I think the other is just that from a moral standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, everybody deserves to be on the map. Everybody deserves to be on the map whether or not they're in a position to put themselves on the map today. And so while we absolutely should continue our efforts to build this community, we absolutely should be um, training people on how to map and how to map their communities, we also can't wait for that effort in order to, um, to, to expand the map to, to, to the, uh, to, uh, across the world. So, what I think we should be thinking about is, how, is an overall approach where we are um, empowering this community that we're developing to be better at doing mapping, to be more effective in the ways that they map, uh, and to be doing it faster and more accurately. So where do uh, robots come in on that? Um, so there are some things that robots are actually better at than humans. Um, uh, the, there are, um, so, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. The, there's some things that they are able to see that, that humans can't. So for instance, this image of a power line is really, really hard for humans to see, but actually very good for robots to see because they're looking at every single pixel and they can distinguish things that are pixel wide. They can look into data that is really hard for human beings to interpret. We've had a lot of success pulling out power line infrastructure using SAR imagery. SAR imagery is terrible for a human being to look at. Even process, it's still pretty terrible for a human being to look at. But computers don't care. They don't care what, <laughs> that, the pixels are pixels in a lot of ways. And so there's certain sets of data that, are, that were, were, are gonna be really hard to map on the ground, are gonna be really hard to map without having some help. Mangroves would be another one, where it's really hard to just go out with your GPS and map the extent of a mangrove uh, area, re region. So um, that's, that is, what, is one area. But what I'm really more interested in talking about today is where, uh, where robots and computers and machine learning can aid in human efforts. Where can they make our work better? And here are a few ideas that, that we came up with offhand. One is targeting people's attention to the areas that need it most, particularly in a disaster situation. If a robot can quickly do a pass at the data and give an idea of what is the most affected area or what is the most undermapped area or what is the area where it looks like there's a lot of buildings that aren't there, then they can target mappers' attention to things that uh, are where, where the, in, particularly in a post-disaster situation where, the, where they can make the most difference most quickly. They can, more, uh, they can help in providing feedback and, and onboarding people and training people, providing quality assurance. Uh, they can help in directing users to areas that are appropriate for their level of skills. So being able to see, is this a relatively easy area to map or relatively difficult and, 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 and pointing people to that, um, which was a great idea that Blake had had at, at the Hot Summit doing the stuff that nobody wants to do. There's a lot of boring and repetitive stuff that actually is really good for computers to do that, t that tires people easily. And so if you can take some of that cognitive load off and allow humans to do the parts that they're good at, then that's another way that you can make it more interesting and, and, and keep people uh, and use people for the, uh, to, to be more effective and to, to do more of what they're, what they're better at and to help them work faster. So um, the... I want to present uh, a, a rough straw man of how this could look in practice. This is something that we developed at the Hot Summit uh, and, and had some really good feedback from people there. So some of you may have already seen this. Uh, but I think it's a really good, again, straw man workflow about how machine learning could be integrated into the existing workflow uh, for something like HOT or something like OSM. One is on the, on the HOT side, you could imagine a case where somebody setting up a hot task could quickly do a scan of an area and pull out some contextual information that allows uh, volunteers, mappers, to be able to better plan their time or better, better select areas to map. So in setting up a, an area of interest, you could do that sort of scan. And then in the grid that comes back, you could provide some contextual layer, and that might be Focus on here because it looks like there's a lot of damage here. Or that could be, oh, you're a beginner. These look like easier squares for you to engage in. You're an expert, maybe focused on this part of, of highly dense urban area that's actually really difficult to map. Uh, those are the sorts of things that, that a computer would be really good at. Another, once somebody selects an area, 
you could imagine a situation where a, a, a machine learning process did a very quick scan to try to identify features and made some suggestions on where it thought those were. And if the computer did a very good, a pretty good job, then this becomes a very quick cleaning effort. It basically becomes human validation rather than a drawing from, from scratch. You would certainly want to allow people to get rid of those if they weren't accurate, if the, if the computer was very off. But it, and we think that in a lot of cases, we've seen that, that this can be um, a good way to save some time. Um, it also means that we need slightly different tools in order to be able to do, uh, to do mapping. And, and I know that, that Facebook said that they're working on other versions of ID that are specifically designed for cleaning the outputs of a computer vision process. Similarly, that's one of the things that, that, we've, that we've put a little bit of work into. There's a tool called Scrub, which is open source. It's on the development C GitHub site, which is uh, a very early stage uh, version, stripped down, very stripped down version of ID or alternative to ID that's specifically focused on cleaning the messy out, the, the common sorts of messiness in road prediction. Uh, and then I think using it in the QA process as well. Uh, Drishti mentioned OSM Cha, which, which some of the folks uh, at, at Mapbox and others have been working on. Uh, it already does a pretty good job of looking for certain sorts of common mistakes or certain sorts of things that might be problematic. But it, wouldn't it be great if, it, if, if you had a process that was actually learning from, uh, as, as the community develops, of what are new ways that people are making mistakes and what are new sorts of things to look for to highlight those so that the very limited people who are available to do that verification on OSM overall are focusing their attentions on the places that are most likely to be useful. Um, so how do we do this? How do we move forward on this? And what are some of the principles that we should espouse in, in, in trying to get this right? One is humans first. I mean, this is very much about taking our existing community and empowering it to be more effective. And we should be, uh, we should, nobody should be under the assumption that robots are going to replace humans. We can only aspire to the case where they're helping humans be better. And so human needs should rule the day. And when we're thinking about usability and how to apply these in, in comfortable ways, like that, that, should, that should be something that we, we put, we give priority to. Uh, open and audible, auditable algorithms. Uh, particularly when we're talking about building things into existing workflows, it's really important that the math behind it be open and auditable for people to trust it, for people to be able to repeat it, for people to be able to improve it. Little aside, so just for those of you who are not in, like, machine, immersed in machine learning, there are a number of different parts of this process. There's the beginning training data, which involves some degree of imagery, some degree of what is called label data, but sort of the truth on the ground. Um, all of that is sort of the input data. And then there's a framework for turning that data into an equation. And the output is really an equation, uh, a set of, of math, a model for telling a computer how to identify roads or identify buildings. The piece that I'm really focused on is that math at the end. It's, it, I think it would be great, personally, at a personal level, if those other parts are open. I think there's a lot of value to that. But for the purposes of just making, uh, but the argument that I'm really making here is that that last piece, the model, the math behind it, should really be open if we are integrating it into workflows. I think you could certainly use a closed approach to producing data, and if it is high quality data, do an import or do, find some other way to, to get that into OSM, which I think has largely been Facebook's approach. I think they've found some really successful ways of doing that. Um, but, but again, for, for workflow, and, and I'd be happy to hear some discussion on that. And then the other part of it, I think, is, is move fast. And certainly, OSM is not a, a community of people who sit around. It is very much a, a JFDI, as we say at, uh, at DevSeed, just fucking do it kind of community of getting in there and doing things. But I, and I do think that like, what I would love to see come out of this is a, is a consensus among people who are interested in this, a bit of leadership on what, what are the next steps, what are the things that we think are, are most important. I would love to, for us to come out this weekend with a bit more of a roadmap of where we want to go in the community so that we can start putting some resources behind it from the different companies that are involved, from different NGOs that are involved, from different funders who want to see this happen. I think the thing that's holding that back right now is, is getting to that clear vision. I would love to see that come out of a birds of a feather. The other part of leadership that is important, um, uh, Sean had mentioned at the beginning of his, his talk, uh, OSM Foundation. So just to, clear, to add on to that a little bit for those who are new, uh, Kevin had talked about in the, in the beginning how important it is to be part of OSM US. 
absolutely agree, $20 a month, best $20 you will spend, and you get to be part of this, this $20 a year, year, sorry, and you, get to be part of, uh, and you can support this community and all the great work that they've been doing. But then at the higher level, OSM Foundation really maintains the infrastructure and, and the leadership around how that is deployed. Infrastructure is gonna be a really important part of how this unfolds, and so I think, you uh, contributing to that as well is, is, is really important to make sure that we have the, the resources to do this, but also to um, contributing that, your voice to that is just as important. And so more so than the $20 that's involved is the being involved in voting and being involved in, in, in meetings and having a real voice in how this develops, that's what's gonna allow us to run fast. And so very much encourage you to take up, uh, to find Mikkel. Is Mikkel still here? Ah, oh, Mikkel. Uh, find Mikkel. Uh, or, or find Dale uh, if you want to, to join the OSM Foundation. All right, that's all I have. All right, thank you. Yeah.